Okay, great. Thank you for the introduction. And yes, uh, IBM 360, that's uh, my consulting firm, and it's actually standing for investing for better nutrition. So it's not saying investing in better nutrition. It says investing for better nutrition, and there's a reason for it, because when we want to improve nutrition, we can have different investments, be it directly nutrition or be it indirectly through finance investments or infrastructure or so on. So I'm actually quite pleased to be here, and it comes back to a, a, a meeting that we had where Professor, uh, Professor Anyaban was there in Singapore, um, where we actually talked about processed foods. And um, it might be maybe a question for you, why do I want to talk about processed foods when we are sitting here? I assume most of you are economists or anthropologists, social scientists. I mean, you're shaking what are you specifically? Hmm? Environmental, yeah, very good. So it's a, it's it's, it's a quite a diverse uh, uh, auditorium, which I think is great, because um, one of the problems that we face is often uh, nutrition science. We stay in our own silo and we actually do not communicate with the other sectors. And it's not only that we do not communicate; it's also we don't know really how to communicate, because you will see when I go through the presentation, there's an economic case if you do not tackle malnutrition, but it's very difficult for us to communicate. So that's why the title of today will be Diets in Transition, Urbanization and Processed Food at the Heart of Malnutrition Crisis in Emerging Asian country, Asia's Countries. That's a very um, top on title because as you have seen, Asia has a lot of problems and I will walk you through because my outline will actually talk about, my outline of the presentation will be that I will introduce you the new norm of malnutrition, which I think is important for you. Asia's tra nutrition tra transition. We also shortly talk about the base of the pyramid market, the market potential, key players and strategies in nutrition improvement, way forward and some key takeaways. So um, I'm sure you are not familiar with this, but I'm just saying that since 2014, every year comes out a global nutrition report. And in comparison to other nutrition reports, this is a report that actually is written in a way everybody can understand it. It is not only full with statistics, it is really depicting the picture, where are we standing in terms of nutrition in the world. And unfortunately, it's, the picture doesn't look very good. Uh, already in 2014 and 2015, and now the latest in 2016, is depicting, describing there is a new norm of malnutrition. Nearly every country in the world has a nutrition problem, has a malnutrition problem. And be it overnutrition, be it undernutrition, be it micronutrient deficiencies, or be it non-communicable diseases. So that means that nutrition problem is a big, <coughs> huge problem. And I would actually advise to look out for the next uh, GNR um, Global Nutrition Report because it is a very interesting report to read. I can give the links afterwards. Now, I don't want to go into this because you will have, of course, my presentation available, but the statistics, they are, in terms of sheer numbers, they don't look either, of course, well. Uh, two billion people have vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And two billion people are obese. And we have about 800 million people, they still go to bed and are hungry. So I could go on with the statistics. Um, but the shocking picture, and that's why Asia is really you know, very important to look at, is that we have countries like in Indonesia, this is Indonesia, these two. We have countries where children who are too thin for their weight, and we call this wasting, actually the same prevalence we have of children that are obese. And we call this the double burden of malnutrition because we have underweight kids and obese kids. And now in Indonesia, for example, the prevalence is 12%, 12% of all the children below five years. So it's quite shocking that now we have countries where we have obesity rising in the same way that we still have undernutrition. And you can look uh, later. Uh, you know, through these statistics, but the important one is this red line shows you it's a public health threshold. So it's a public health problem. And if you see in, in ASEAN countries, most of them have a problem with the children who are too thin for their weight. Now, 
The other big epidemic which you have heard about is about diabetes. And since about 1980, diabetes has quadrupled. So um, even though we say here 387, but in 2014, we talk about 422 million people that have diabetes. But the important message here is that 77 of the people with diabetes live in low and middle income countries. And when you look at Asia, you can see that the bulk of the numbers are really lying in Asia. And the very sad point is that you see 52% undiagnosed, 53% undiagnosed. So that means actually every second person who has, every person who, who has a diabetes, the second person doesn't know that they have diabetes. So you should actually double this. So it's unbelievably high figures. Um, we go further with the statistics, and this is the global hidden hunger map. It's also interesting for you if you want to cross, cross, you know, cross sectors in terms of science. It depicts where actually we have problems of iron deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, iodine, etc. And as you see with the big circles, we have Asia and we have Africa. And again, knowing the numbers in Asia, where most of the population live, we have the highest problem. So this is a report that came out in 2013 by the Asian Development Bank, which very nicely described the situation. This is the quote I think is the most important to remember. Asia and the Pacific's drive for food security has focused too narrowly on quantity with a surge in obesity and still high levels of malnutrition in some countries, highlighting the need for a new approach. What that says is that most of the countries have actually banked on self-reliance banked on quantity, but they have actually forgotten to look into quality of the food. If you only produce stables, they bring forward what? They bring forward carbohydrates, they bring forward the calories. But you also have to look about the other foods. What about veggies? What about fruits? Um, and and um, the point is, despite increasing consumption of calories, there is not a dramatic reduction in malnutrition. Actually, it's even worse because there are still the vitamin and mineral deficiencies. This is another uh, way on how to explain it, and I will not actually go too much into this because you can look at, you can look at this. But very, very sad is more than 40% of the children in several Asian Pacific countries are stunted. And stunted, you need to know also, I think, because stunting means that you have a child that is about seven years old, but is that high, like a five-year-old. So they are too small, that they are not high enough for their age. And this is not only that you see it in the height. Stunting is very important to understand because it has a tremendous impact on your brain development. And that means that you will never reach actually your full development, be it IQ, be it full productivity when you're an adult. And when you have been standard, you will also be more prone to be sick. So it's a very serious long-term situation and Asia has a lot. Now, this is where actually the economists come in. All of this, if we tackle malnutrition, what can we actually get? You see? We can improve labor market returns to nutrition. So 33% less likely to remain in poverty by adulthood, and then standard deviation in height for age, increased per capita consumption level of the household that they live in by almost 20%. We can have a better performance in school, etc. And the list can go on and can go on. But somehow we still haven't really made the political change to actually have countries saying, yes, we really want to tackle malnutrition. Now, uh, you might know Susan Horton. She is an economist and she has been in the Copenhagen Consensus, who was a, a meeting that came every four years together with uh, prize uh, Nobel laureates in economy. And they actually um, looked at malnutrition and they also looked at strategies and they came forward and said food fortification is one of the most cost-effective strategies that you can do if you want to reduce malnutrition, particularly vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And when you look at some of those, of those quotes, this is what we just published, uh, the economic burden of malnutrition in pregnant women and children under five years of age in Cambodia. It's 260 million US dollars are lost by not addressing malnutrition. So the Cambodian government loses this every year. These are big numbers for countries like Cambodia. 
Um, the question is now, so when we look at these health statistics, so do we eat the wrong foods? I mean, what's going on? So when we look at, I like this, this is the conceptual, this is the former conceptual framework of malnutrition. So when you look at, you have the manifestation, which is malnutrition, you have the immediate causes, disease, inadequate dietary intake, and then you have underlying causes and basic causes. But when we look at the disease, which is immediate cause, when we look at the health statistics, particularly in Asia, we have improved quite a lot maternal mortality, infant mortality, all those health statistics, they have improved quite a lot. So we cannot say that actually on the disease side, we have not advanced. But when we look at the obesity, when we look at still the undernutrition, and when we look at the inappropriate diet, we can actually say that the inadequate dietary intake, there is something wrong. And the quantity and quality of dietary intake needs to be respected. And this is why we call for more nutrient-dense food. Nutrient-dense food are those foods that give you in one bite the nutrients you need, instead of calorie-dense food that give you in one bite just the calories, but not all the nutrients. Now, we also said in the title that I will look at the nutrition transition. In particularly in Asia. And um, Asia is very uh, interesting because we said we have emerging countries, we have GDP growth, general, I don't know, it's about 7% in ASEAN at least. So uh, industry growth, economic growth, but then we also have, of course, a transition in diet. And it is very important to understand not only that when people have more money that they want to eat more meat, for example, or they might even want to eat more uh, milk, they want to use to get milk or yogurt, etc. So there is a shift. But there is also a shift, sorry, but there is also a shift when we look at the population. This is the total population, and this is actually the population living in less developed countries, and this is the population living in developed countries. And what you see is much more people are living in less developed countries. And out of those less developed countries, out of this green line, you will see that much more will live in urban areas. So the trend that Asia has a huge urbanized population is already there and documented in the figures. And since 2008, more than 50% of the population are living in urban areas globally anyway. So this change, this demographic change, brings also changes in how we eat the food and where we eat the food. So, if we look at rural Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam, these are the three countries, you will actually see that the rural and the urban consumers do not differ so much. Because you have own production, yes, of course, in the urban it's very small, that's different. But when you look at the at, let's look at the low processed and the high processed, which are those columns. You see? There is not such a big difference. Maybe in Vietnam there is still a, big, a bigger difference. But there is not such a big difference between the rural and the urban people, how they get their food, and where do they get their food. So what this figure means is that a consumer in Bangladesh who lives in the urban areas or in the rural areas they both go predominantly to a market to buy their food. And they do not buy unprocessed food, they actually buy processed food. And this is very important because I've been in Bangladesh, I've worked all over the places, so when I first saw this report, I said, this can't be, it's not possible, okay? This is not possible. In Bangladesh, I know these people, they go and, you know, no. We have to change because for you who have traveled, you will see in every little place there is a little shop. There is a little, little, little place and what can you get there? You get mostly the processed foods. You might get one fruit or whatever, but the majority is processed food. And this is very much to remember. And then of course there is a difference between the low processed and the high processed, and for which I will you know, explain to you later. This was the definition that was taken by this, and uh, Professor Reardon is a very well-known professor. He's from Michigan State University, actually, <laughs> where I also studied, happened, but he wasn't there yet. Um, he's a specialist, and he spends most of his time, actually, now in China, because he, he looks at 
the urbanization, the diet change and transformation of food supply chains in Asia. The same he has also done for Africa, but right now he's focusing on, on China. And his, um, his work is really fascinating because he opens up some, some ideas, not only ideas, he changes some, some opinions. You know, I had my opinion, I thought it's not possible, but when you read it and you let science talk and you believe evidence-based, then you have to really think twice. So this is his definition that he did. I mean, basically processed food, your rice is a processed food. Yeah? So that's not really a problem. No, yeah, that's the not. Low, the low processed is That's not a problem. We, 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 we come back to that. That's not a problem. You know, and even, let's say, processed, uh, high processed foods should not be a problem. We, we come to that. But what you have here is a definition. So basically what you see, most of the food that we have is actually processed. Be it processed low or be it processed high. Yeah. Now, um, you know the, my slides, <laughs> Professor Anima, because he saw them. So this is on the left. Is a, this is not a processed food. Okay? But this is a processed food. But this is my processed food I cook at home. So what's the difference? The difference is I know what I do. I chop the potato, first I wash it, I chop the potato and I know I put some oil maybe in the pan and I put a little bit of salt or some tea or whatever. I know exactly what I do to serve this processed, low processed food to my family. Now, it becomes a bit more difficult. This I also serve to my sons, not now anymore, they are now grown up, but I serve them fish fingers <laughs> until I prepared also my presentation a couple of months ago and then I realized, wow, fish fingers. Look at this. This is the most important. 53% 50 is fish, plus 10 additives, including flour, oil, and salt. Wow, then I said, but I thought I'd give them fish fingers. So what, what it means is, the more processed food you have, the less real food substance is in the processed food. And that's where actually the problematic starts. And here are the ultra-processed foods. Um, sausages and of course our loved instant noodles which I love our I love these instant noodles and uh, of course they are highly processed and they are very caloric and there are a lot of uh, uh, things in it that we can discuss later that you should really watch out for example um, and then of course we come to the very tough categories these are the the sugar sweetened beverages and as you know, there is a, a huge uh, you know, discussion going on and uh, also now just recently uh, some more states and counties in the, in, in the states have taken, adopted sugar taxes, the Philippines plays with it. I don't know if Hong Kong has, is thinking about a sugar tax. We, we can discuss about this because I personally think a sugar tax alone doesn't solve the problem, but we'll come back to that. So keep that in mind. This is also processed food, yeah? Pretty bad one, actually. So, to come back to your question you said about processed foods, we have to actually look at the history of processed foods because not all processed foods are bad. And in history, why we had them is because the industrialization, they allowed us to have an efficient uh, uh, form formulation of the food. We can mass manufacture the food and we can also distribute and sell it very well. And the first First that came up were, are the army rations. Everybody remembers army rations or remembers army rations. They are full of processed foods, you know, and you can keep them for months or years. I don't know, I think they have a shelf life for maybe two or three years. Yeah? But they give you everything because they are fortified, yeah? for example. Then also what happened with the, with, with the processed food, it also helped that we had no problem in food insecurity and we had declines in nutrient deficiencies. Because what happened in the early 20th century, uh, food fortification was adopted to help to, help to reduce beriberi, to help to reduce pelagra, to help to reduce scurvy, and all of those. So it's not so, I mean, the history tells us that processed foods can be very, very helpful by actually tackling certain problems. But now what happened then, here it starts. So there was a cheap surplus grain and food science technology advances, what happens? Processed products made from cheap ingredients and additives. Basically what happened is then, then of course the business angle came in, the thinking, oh, I can actually make this product, but I can 
substitute this ingredient with a cheaper one. Hmm, good, so I gain more money. And, and that's how it started. So you replace sugar with corn syrup and, you know, and, and all this. I mean, I don't have to name it. But that's how it started. And then what we saw was, a, of course, a rapid increase in non-communicable diseases and first in the high-income countries, and now we have it actually globally. And particularly now we have it in the poorer segments of the population. And there is a reason for it, which I will tell you. So the objections to processed food products is basically they are made, the ultra-processed foods are made with little or no whole foods. It's, that's true. I mean, my fish fingers, you know, that's still a good one because it's 53% fish. But you can have, you have processed foods where actually you really have to look how much is in it. And I, I, I recommend you, next time when you go shopping, look, look a little bit at the ingredients. You would be very much astonished. Particularly also those uh, food that go fresh into the oven. You know, these french fries, which are really great. You, can, you take them and you just put them in the oven, wonderful, but look how much potatoes is actually in there. Um, but the very bad and negative influence on our health is that they are typically energy dense, have a high glycemic load, are low in dietary fiber, micronutrients and phytochemicals, and are high in unhealthy types of dietary fat, free sugars and sodium. Because again, those more unhealthy types are cheaper and they replace the more expensive ingredients. So, is nutritious food expensive? There we have the discussion about nutrient-dense versus energy-dense, to which I referred before. You have a bite, you bite it, you have food, you get in one hand the nutrients that you need, because it's a nutrient-dense food. On the other hand, you have the same handful, you eat it, but you only get calories because it's caloric dense. So what happens is that the energy dense foods, they are normally in dried form and that's why you know they are also cheaper than when you have a nutrient dense food which are normally in fresh form. A nutrient dense food, what can we say? We, we can say of course it's an egg, it's also fruits and vegetables, but if you go into oils in terms, this is energy dense, or you go into pastries, you have to be careful. Deli meat. So we have to see what we actually eat during the day or during our life. Otherwise, we might derail and become all, you know, obese or overweight. And here, uh, I want to put your attention to this. One US dollar of energy dense foods buys more calories than one US dollar of nutrient dense foods. And the question, of course, cheap foods, fuel, and obesity. Why do I want that you think about this? I mean, the few economists who are here, of course, it's very simple. If I am poor, I have five kids to feed, I have a husband. If I don't bring home the food, my husband will not be happy, the kids will not be happy, so what do I do? I make decisions on cost of the food. And if I go into a shop and I can buy cheaper food, and I can buy more, then I will buy the cheaper food, of course. And that's actually, I think, that's one of the biggest problems that is fueling obesity. It's the cost, the cost of the food and what we can buy for money. Um, I don't want to go into this. This is just for you. But, you know, there is still a, a, a substantial uh, proportion in uh, East Asia and, and the Pacific living on less than $1.25 a day. Um, I think you should, you should just need to know that because Asia is not... Uh, homogeneous. Asia has a huge population who is still living very in very uh, precarious situations. Now this is important. Um, this is what I said. The annual income spent on food and malnutrition rate. So here, for example, in Indonesia, we have 44.1% is spent on food and beverages. But this big bubble also shows that we have a huge problem in terms of malnutrition. This is related to stunting. This is related to those kids who are not tall enough for their age. So what this means is that these people, they spend a lot of their money on food, but still the kids and their situation shows that they have a tremendous nutrition problem. So there's something, there's definitely something wrong. And you, you remember the conceptual framework? 
on the left was the nutrient intake and on the right was the disease, I think there's something wrong what they put in their mouth, what they eat. That's what this graph shows you. You see, Pakistan is the same. 45% spend on food and over 40% problem of standing. So there's something wrong. A different, a different um, just basically it's the same, it's the same showing, but what this one also tells you is the base of the pyramid spends about 2.3 trillion a year dollars, US dollars, on food and beverages. Yeah. And what it shows here is the expenditure, again, like I explained, but it doesn't show you the correlation with the malnutrition rate, but it's the same figure. So when we look at the, at the base of the pyramid, maybe you have some updated figures, but this is normally what, what, what we still use. Um, when we look from an industry point, we see that $2 billion, 10 to $60 a day, the purchasing power is about 12.5 US trillion. And this is a market that is fairly urban, extremely well competitive and well served. But when we look at the 3 billion people who are living between one and $10 a day, they spend 5 trillion every year. And out of those 5 trillion, they spend 2.3 trillion on food and beverages. But when we look at the food and the beverage market, it's a very, changing food consumption market, it's an underdeserved market, it's a lot of informal economy, and inefficient and little competition. And why I'm highlighting this is because my thrive is that we would like to improve the processed foods, we would like to improve nutrition. But if we do not take those people and these characteristics of the market into consideration, we will not achieve it. Innovation is mostly up here, because this is where the industries can actually make their primes, their benefits. So these are key players, normal key players we have, government, industry, consumer, NGO and academia. I will come back to their roles. Those are what I call, um, this is my nutrition value chain ball, you know. If we want to do something in food and nutrition, then we actually have to work with all those uh, partners, otherwise we cannot. You can't play football if there is a bubble in a football. You can only play football if it's a round ball. The same is if you want to achieve something in the food and nutrition environment, those have to work hand in hand together. And not one, one uh, going out and making a specific law or industry going out and making a specific food. It must be hand in hand and academia and NGOs and the consumer. So um, just very quickly, just to, to give you this wonderful picture. What you see here is, this is the explanation why you should eat a diversified diet. Everybody from you, I'm sure you have either seen the pyramids, the pagodas, because they are very different diet um, recommendations and how they are presented. But to make it very short, why you have to eat a diversified diet is because all those micronutrients which are needed in small amounts, the vitamins A, the iron, the iodine, selenium, name it, of course, calcium and everything. They all come from all these very different, different foods. Yeah? So who eats like this every day? Very few people, okay? including you, including me. But we all need them because all those micronutrients, they have all very important functions to do. So what it means is that we had strategies to bring forward to people when they don't eat this diversified diet, what can you do? There were strategies which the public health embraced, and then there are market strategies. And market strategies is biofortification, food fortification, and dietary diversification. Except this doesn't really work that well, because there are problems in terms of money, because you need money to eat very healthy. Um, there is problem of accessibility, affordability. So those strategies, they are, you know, we have to work hard on them, but the public health sector has targeted health interventions. So, for example, has iron supplementation to pregnant women or has specific foods through their safety nets. But it's not enough. I think this should go hand in hand and not diversing. So, there are some foods that are fortified 
So if you eat flour, you can e eat fortified flour, you can eat fortified uh, soy sauce, you can eat fortified oil, etc., to make sure that you might get what you needed. I don't want to go into that. One, one um, point that I wanted to bring back is processed food is not always negative. In the emergency sector, I, I worked 16 years in the emergency sector. When I started, it was in the early 80s, we did not have these foods. We did not have that. We had very basic food. We had corn soy blend, we had corn soy milk, and then we had to make a, a porridge and had to give it. This is a revolution because this was actually invented in the late 90s and it is the ready-to-use foods. You might have heard about plum peanut. This is given. It's a it's this, this one. It's a fuel like this. You give it to a very severe malnourished child. What you see on TV, you know, the unfortunate children, skeletons, you give it to them and within six weeks they are rehabilitated. We could have never done this in the 80s with the food we had. So processed food, if it's well done and if it's really developed to respond to a, a, a specific issue, is very important. Now, um, this is a, a, a review that I don't want to go in because you, you, you can read it yourself and there is, a, there is a, the, you know, the reference given. It is just that micronutrients, uh, micronutrient fortification, they have shown that they actually work. Yeah? And um, there are a lot of discussions always that, oh, uh, is it working? No, there are reviews, substantial reviews that micronutrient fortification works. If you fortify the food correctly, it works. Um, this is the same. Um, I was just back, I was talking about, uh, just last week I was in Jakarta and I talked about beverages because processed foods, as I told you, doesn't stop with beverages. So I was giving a presentation and we looked into functional beverages, the emerging side of functional foods. There are a lot of beverages. When you go and shop, you will see there are a lot of beverages. The fall down on those beverages are the health claims and we need much more research and we, we need much more documentation on the health claims. Otherwise, we have seen in specific, specific uh, studies that if you have multiple micronutrient fortification of non-dairy products, you can actually reduce iron deficiency. You can. So it's also a way forward. Now, given the central role of food in the double burden of malnutrition, a food-based strategy to redress the energy nutrient balance in the food system is needed. And what this means is that we really need to work together with the industry because we need to embrace them so that appropriate products are produced. And um, I think here this is the most important one. Um, but we should have an updated for the 21st century. So not only stable foods. Stable foods is oil, salt, uh, uh, salt is a um, uh, condiment, but it's oil, it's flour, um, maize. We should also look into the processed foods and we should re-engineer them to promote health and help close the nutrient gaps in modern diets. Because processed foods, they don't go away. They stay with us because we are working, we are living in urban areas. Um, they have a longer shelf lives. So they actually are coming in and taking the, the place now of the majority of our purchases per day is processed foods. So this is now the government's role. We have the industry, we have the consumer, and we have NGO and academia. Um, it's very important that we have appropriate research, knowledge, and advocacy that comes out from academia. Um, but also from NGOs, because NGOs, they're also doing uh, uh, often um, programmatic research who can fuel who can fuel you know, the debate. Um, industry comes with innovation and they come with a financial sustainability. Once there is a product that the consumer likes, it will be eaten, it will be eaten and it will stay. So this should not be underestimated what it really means financial sustainability because if it's a product that it's really healthy but the con consumer doesn't want to eat it, it will not fly. It might fly if the government then comes in and makes maybe some regulations or makes incentives, you know, with subsidies or with whatever. So, so that's, that's why I'm saying this, these stakeholders, they really need to work together. Now, lastly, uh, you can actually have sort of incremental improvement, and that means 
um, you can encourage sharing of research and best practices in support of health promoting processed food products. So that's the traditional way. You, you would look at the su supply chains, you would look at, at uh, the processes and outputs uh, so that you can actually increase the nutrient density. But what you can also do, you can do a little bit of disruptive innovation because you can uh, uh, encourage an entrepreneurs to take much more risks than the big companies would do and come forward with new products or with new reformulation by maybe giving them some incentives. Maybe the government will do that. Or also what you could do, I, I, I haven't seen a food hackathon. We have lots of hackathons, but a food hackathon has never been done. So we have to really think out of the box because the processed food is really standing there and will not go away. But we need to improve them, the majority. Oh, Hecate. Yeah, well, uh, it's just you bring the people together and you don't let them out until they have done something. <laughs> yeah, there, was, uh, there were a couple of hackathons uh, in the IT world. You, 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 you did one too? Okay, well, uh, you, you explained it. Okay, so may maybe you have one, then you have to uh, correct me if I said that there are not uh, many. So, in terms of the research priorities, of course, we need scientific research to increase the evidence base for fortification beyond iron anemia and in developing countries. This is a very generic one, which I said, because um, fortification is, is used and very well uh, documented around iron. Um, but then if we have the other micronutrients, there's still, we, we could do better. But, okay. I rather think we should have a product R&D to determine optimal vehicles and nutrient formulations to achieve health-promoting functional food and beverage profiles while reducing undesirable ingredients such as sugar, salt, unhealthy fats, etc. Why I'm saying this is because you have companies who have reduced their sugar content in their products. The result was the consumer didn't want to eat it anymore. And so the company said, well, we can't do that because we are losing. That's why we need R&D that actually helps the companies to keep that type of food so that the consumer still eats it but take out the unhealthy ingredients. And for this, I think it can only be R&D. Um, and we have to push for that. The market research is very uh, important um, because we need to actually understand uh, the, the nutritionally undeserved population groups. We need to understand because the obesity uh, started first, everybody sort of, the rich got obese because we were eating ourselves, you know, into obesity. But what happens now, and this is why I'm giving this uh, uh, presentation and why I want that you pay attention. The obesity problem in Asia is in certain countries with the poor. In some countries it's still with the rich but it trickles down to the poor and the reason is that the poor make decisions based on cost and price when they buy food and the problem is that some of the food that is cheap is also not the healthy one. So that's what we have to understand. And that doesn't mean that we have to do lifestyle, we have to do sports, we have to whatever. But for a poorer person who has less income and less money to spend on food, this person will always buy food in terms of cost and not in terms of health choices. And this is something we need to really fully understand. So to sum up, um, yeah, to sum up, um, I think uh, one important point for you in your, in your life is despite increasingly robust food security in Asia, the double burden of malnutrition, undernutrition and obesity and disease has become the new norm. Normally we are starting now, uh, we are using now the triple burden of malnutrition because what we add onto this undernutrition and obesity are the vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Um, and I'm sitting actually uh, also on the board of the Rice Bowl Index. The Rice Bowl Index is, uh, is an index that is uh, developed by Syngenta, who looks at food security in Asia. And my role is to actually discuss, when we have the board meetings, always tell them, if you only look at food security and not on also on nutrition security, you're missing the point. So I have this role to actually explain to to economists and agronomists and agricultural people that only yield, 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 that does not help us. We have to have yield and quality. It's a very long way, I think, as we still have to do. Um, 
Cheap energy-dense nutrient-poor processed products are increasingly becoming a larger share of the modern diet in low- and medium-income Asian countries. This is something that is happening. Uh, the reason I gave you why, uh, urban transition, um, also women are working. Uh, we cannot stand uh, behind the, uh, and cook a lot. I mean, uh, in Asia it's slightly bit different, but still, uh, um, women are active and um, the price is very important. Um, families living in urban areas, you have, I'm going to say, very um, intense working hours in certain uh, professions. So you actually tend to, you get the processed food, put it either in the microwave or you, you do, you know, you just heat it up and that's it. And there is also, there is a reason, because it, life is more convenient. Um, the access to low cost excess calories uh, that's the one what I said, that one US dollar uh, of uh, calorie dense pays more, uh, buys you more, uh, one US dollar of cheap uh, calorie dense food gives you more calories, so you don't feel that hungry than if you go uh, and buy uh, nutrient dense foods because those are veggies or, you know, fruits and so on. Um, and then the sedentary lifestyle in urban environments. Um, and then uh, this is here for the economists, and for the politicians, that's I think is the one of the arguments that makes governments move. Not this, not maybe the, the others, but this one is the one. It's the money. It's when you lose GDP three percent, four percent per year, uh, and that's what we actually shown uh, in our article about Cambodia. Um, the government actually reacted quite heavily. Uh, it was uh, covered in the in the. Um, Phnom Penh Post and the Daily, they have to use newspapers, it, it was covered. So it made quite some, some, some waves because 260, 60 million I mean, per year, that's, you have to justify that. It, um, so um, then one part of the solution is to harness the increasing consumption of processed foods and beverages and reformulating them to promote health with the help of micronutrient fortification. Yes, of course, reformulation. But uh, it's not that if you reformulate your, um, your processed food and you just uh, fortify it, that doesn't help. You really have to look at the ingredients because the devil really lies in the ingredients with processed, processed foods. Um, and then uh, the ultimate goal is to make health promoting easily accessible and suitable affordable processed food and beverage products so, so all, all available all over in the food environment so that nutrition improvement happens as a matter of course. So let's say if I go out and I have $5 or $3 and I want to buy some food, if I can only buy acceptable healthy food and I do not have the choice of the other foods, of course then I have nothing else to buy. Would that be a way forward? I mean, some of the taxes is a way to hinder consumers to buy certain foods because they know consciously that they have to pay more for this. So there are ways forward, but it's a real, it's a real challenge um, because I do think that um, a lot of the, of the processed foods are so convenient that we have to really find ways to replace them. And we also have to understand that, I mean, for those who have children, when you teach your child from the beginning to drink water, the child drinks water and maybe drinks when it's seven, eight or nine, once in a while a Coke. I mean, we did that. I mean, they had water and that's it. And then when there was a party, there was a Coke. But it, and, and it's just an example. But if you have children that already start very early exposed to all type of processed food, all type of beverages and all type of, what do you expect with their adults? It's very difficult to change an adult in its food habits. It's very difficult and, you know, um, that's why we actually have to, to, to really think about. I, I, I do think it's not so easy to just go forward and say, yes, let's reformulate the processed food and that's it. No, because we have examples from the industries where they actually try to reduce the sugar and, and you know, and it didn't work. Thank you very much <laughs> for your attention. Okay, we have some time for questions. Maybe I can start with a question. Yeah. Um, so you didn't talk much about public education, about yeah. trying to uh, change people's preferences just by explaining. Yes. You know what you. Yes. About how terrible it is to eat these things. 
So does that reflect some pessimism on <laughs> yes, your it part does. that this would, would have any effect? It does, it does a little bit. Uh, there, there are two reasons or se several reasons for um, First of all, I think um, the public health sector has very... Uh, um, uh, the messages are brought forward in the way, if you eat this, it's bad, it's always negative. I mean, do not eat that because, or eat, if you eat that, it creates cancer, or, you know, th this type of ne negative ways. What I've seen ch uh, changes in some governments is they have adopted uh, ways forward how to address and reach the adolescent population or the youth. And then, I mean, in, in Singapore, what I see, what they try to do with the Health Promotion Board, I mean, they, they, they try to actually embrace the situation quite in a, in a, in, a, in a very good way. I mean, they declare now that you have to write down all the calories on every food. Uh, they have a healthy food choice logo. So there are, there are some educational matters going forward. But I think where we come from, let's say 40 years ago or 30 years ago, it was basically always the message. If you eat this, it's bad. If you eat this, you will be sick. It was not uh, appealing messages, and the consumers, what we have seen is, uh, is unmanageable. The consumer eats what he wants and what he likes, no matter what the health minister might have done in a very appropriate health message. So I think, um, for me, I think the, 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 the messaging needs to change and it needs to be much more attractive. Look at some of the big companies, and I don't want to mention the name, but they actually, they promote happiness, they promote uh, uh, positiveness in there, and we all fall into that trap. So that's why. Other questions? Yeah, over here. Hi. Thank you. I would like to follow up on this um, public education. So I think nowadays there are so many ingredients that, of course, for for the normal consumer, it's very difficult to say is this really healthy or not. So have you, are there, like, I mean, people nowadays, they're on the internet almost 24-7. Uh, what kind of tools are currently available that make it easier for the consumer, or is there anything that, that you know of, that make it easier for the consumer to make a really healthy choice to at least, you know, because I think many people don't even know what they're eating, and if they would know, they would probably not buy it. So yeah. I think it's not just that the consumer is bad and always takes the unhealthy choice. I think often they don't know that they are doing so. So what kind of tools or what kind of things have you heard of or, or, or thought yeah, of yeah, or yeah. so far that could help educating the consumer mm -hmm. in an easy way? I mean, I mean, um, I, I think your, your comment is really uh, spot on because uh, it's, not, um, it's not that uh, we, we want to eat unhealthy food or so on. I mean, we just don't know once in a while what we are eating, and that includes me. And I have to say, I'm actually trained in this field. But when I once in a while look at what is written either on the internet or what is also written on the ingredients, I really have to think twice, so what does this really mean? I, I do think, personally, that we have not given the consumer very good education to actually navigate the field. What you have seen and you, you have heard about this uh, a debate now about the sugar, sugar bad, sugar good, sugar not, then the fats, good, butter good, not good. So there is a lot of um, conf conflicting information coming and those who are on the internet and really read, I can't tell you exactly where you should go to be totally informed. My attitude was always that you have to look at how you're eating. I mean, normally a plate should be colorful. Yeah? So if you do not have, if you do not have a colorful plate, uh, if you have every day just maybe one color or two colors, then there is a problem. I, I would really do it from this uh, standpoint to bring across a very complicated uh, message, but very simple. And there are some, there are some um, educations about my plate. If you go to the internet, you can look at my plate. Um, and they have, uh, they have different shapes, they have different categories, and it's quite interesting. It helps you to navigate. That's for the what's on the plate, but then what's in the food itself, that's then another big question, because there is, of course, a lot of also controversy, as we have seen controversial responses, as we have seen about the sugar now, uh, and the fat and the butter and so on. So I think... Uh, that's something that you have to actually navigate yourself through um, 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 and try to understand. 
myself, what I do is I do not go into extremes, so I do not go and, and eat all, always the same. Okay? I really have, uh, have certain um, foods that I use. Um, so snacks, for me, they are nuts, there's nothing else, maybe once in a while a chip or so. So that's how I try to do it. And um, it depends on also from where you come. From my background, of course, I have, it's olive oil and that's it, nothing else. So in the Asian context, you had previously a lot of coconut oil. Um, and this was actually pushed away by the cheaper palm oil. And of course, palm oil comes with a price. And, uh, and I think uh, you, there are maybe, I, I don't know, maybe you, you uh, Professor Anneban, I don't know if you know from, 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 your, from your research, but there are some consumer, <laughs> consumer networks, but also the consumer networks, you have to understand what's going on. So I cannot give you a real answer on that because it's a very tricky one, but go and look at the eat the plate, my, my plate. That's a very nice, nice, uh, it's an eye opener. It's really an eye opener. Yeah, the scanning apps, yeah. Mm -hmm. people, so. The scanning apps, yeah, I mean, Sydney is doing, there's a, also, it's called a switch, Georgetown Institute is doing, is doing something on that. Um, the, scanning, uh, the, the scanning apps are very good, but they are limited to, you know, a certain environment because you have to scan all the food before you can actually tell, oh, this is better or this is not so good, so. Uh, I'm Jennifer. I'm currently a UG student in uh, this school. And thank you for the thought-provoking like sharing that you have brought to us. I have one short remark and also one question that I want to ask. Uh, I, I really like how you mentioned that we should change the discourse from talking about energy into nutrient and the importance of that. And Because in the past year, I've been living in Mongolia and mm. actually mobilizing young people for the sustainable, sustainable development goal. And I also still notice it's the discussion of no hunger rather than better nutrients. Uh, so I really think this is important. Um, you might have a question. Uh, from your experience, because you have been sharing, you have been in the front line and having conversation with people and traveling in Asia. Do you have any personal story or any like things you witness firsthand about like the front line of malnutrition in Asia? Like anything that is memorable to you or any good conversation that you have that you can share with us? Oh, so you mean, uh, yeah, I've lived in Asia for quite some, for, mm. me, for, for many years. So you want to know for me what marked me the most in terms of malnutrition? Because, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I understood the answer, but I can say one thing. When I look at uh, Asia, um, one of the problems is that when you have a child, when you have a child, normally what you should do is you should breastfeed if you can. Yeah, I mean, six, six months for sanitary reasons and for reducing infections, but then you should introduce appropriate nutrient-dense complementary food to the to the toddler, or to the six months old, seven months old, eight months old. This is actually not done because what is done in Asia often is that you get your uh, diluted rice or diluted whatever and it's given to the baby. Or what also happens, and this is, I've seen it so often, is once the child knows how to walk at one year age sort of, it goes immediately to the adult food. So there is no, there is no uh, in between, like what we have in the West where we have complementary foods, we have the porridges, specific porridges developed to respond to this very growth intense period um, where the child then gets all the, micronutri all the micro micronutrients and vitamins and the carbos and the proteins and it's very adapted to the development. And I think um, this, I was always stunned that this understanding of com introducing complementary foods in Asia, a specific food that is only for the child, that is a top-notch product, I haven't seen that. And I think that's one of the problems really where we, 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 we have to work, that we get that into, into the, um, the understanding. And of course, um, there are some governments who are uh, adopting micronutrient powders. Micronutrient powders is a little sachet. So when you do your rice porridge, yeah, because rice is not a very good nutrient-based product. I mean, it's not very good, but it's eaten all over. So when you then do your porridge, at the end when it's cooked, you just put the micronutrients on, and then you give it to the baby. That doesn't mean that 
there should be also some vegetables in it. But at least there are some governments who, who are aware of that they have to make sure that the children six months onwards get appropriate food and not just adult food once they are one year old. Okay. Yep. Yeah, very nice talk. I also think a fundamental part of this argument has to do with taste and flavor, right? So you said you like these uh, instant noodles. I mean, would you ever eat this if it didn't come with that flavor packet? No, I oh. eat instant noodles. I have to say, I w without the flavor packet, ah, I, I don't think they would be yeah. so successful. Ah, yeah. You mean without the little things <laughs> right. that you put on? Yeah. So I mean, yeah, it, no, it, I, I need those flavor things. You exactly. Know? I mean, so that, I think that's a key point of the, of all of this, right? So a lot of these processed foods, they have these um, food, these um, you know, flavor additives that yes. they give it. You know, it's not just sugar, it's also these flavor molecules, right? And so, you know, food scientists have figured out, you know, how to make something like, uh, you know, just a carbohydrate noodle taste like a chicken, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and so, you know, why we think that's appealing is because a lot of these flavor molecules are actually precursors to nutrients in, in specific vitamins. There's some research on this. So my question is, I mean, I think this is also a key part. You, you mentioned... Um, you know, there, there's something like a sugar tax that's been implemented mm -hmm. in some U.S. cities. So, you know, one one idea is that should we should have you explored like something like a flavor tax, mm -hmm. or I, but I don't think this would be too successful. I mean, so I think another strategy is to rely on the market market forces, right? So I mean, a lot of our um, you know food food engineering has kind of been um, mostly focused on cost, right? You can look at like a tomato in the U.S. I mean, this thing. Is, it's fresh, it, it can be organic, but sometimes it doesn't taste that great. It just tastes mm -hmm. like water, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go to Italy, I mean, these, these tomatoes, they can be very small, maybe not so, so um, mm -hmm. you know, big, and, but, but they have so much more flavor. And I mean, you just eat one of these and you'll feel full. So, I mean, is this another aspect you're looking at? How to, how to take flavor into account and in, in coming up with better policies? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are all type of things that we have to take into account, and flavor is, is just one of them. We actually have thought the opposite, uh, because we have thought that if we put some vitamins and minerals into those little flavor sachets, and you know the oil or the, the condiments, what you get with the instant noodles, um, then if we put some micronutrients in there, then at least they get some micronutrients, the people who eat them, because some of the people eat predominantly that. Yeah? Um, I think what you are saying is just uh, uh, a way of looking at the whole picture in, in terms of all of the angles. Of course, you can do a lot with flavor, but you have to go one step further. You already have to look at the, the sheer, in, the raw ingredients, because some of the raw ingredients that go into, before you even work with flavors, are less healthy than they could be. And that's, that's where, where we, we, we need to work. I mean, it, well, flavors is just one entrance, you know. But we should, we should, I mean, like flavor and nutrients for the longest time have been directly correlated. That's, that's why we have to think something, if it tastes good, it's good for us. I mean, that, that's how yeah, we but in, 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 in the recent century, I think there's a discourse, okay? Right, exactly, so we should, we, should try to, we should try to fix this. I mean, we have science that will, will improve flavor. We, we should try to, you know, design I mean, if, if it's not just food fortification, it should also be food and flavor fortification. Sure, I agree. I, I yeah. totally agree. I, I totally agree on that. But, uh, you know, I've read substantially about that subject. It's not so easy. That's why I can't say, yeah, great. It's, it's one part. It's one part. But the processed foods, they represent, for me, quite a huge challenge because they represent highly sophisticated food technology. Then they represent consumer acceptance, which we then have to change also. They accept, uh, they present also uh, a cost point because they're cheap. So we have to actually tackle quite a lot of, uh, um, how do you say, quite a lot of topics that make up this whole bunch of processed foods. And do not forget that why I'm saying, I mean, for us, if we eat once a processed food, it's fine, it's not a problem. You're not going to die. It's, I mean, never. But if I eat now every day three times my instant noodles because I love them so much, but also it is the only thing I can afford, then I will have a problem after five years. Definitely. I even have a problem already after six months.
This is, I, what I represent, what I want to get clear is, uh, coming back to the title, in Asia we have an obesity coming that actually stems out of a couple of unfortunate situations. One, you still have millions, millions, who do not have enough money to eat, you have still millions who have not enough money to have a food choice, and you have a situation where uh, um, the, the buying, the purchase decision is made on money, and you have a situation where there are a lot of unhealthy products on the market that are cheap, and that undermine that you can buy healthy foods. The, for, for the poor, because we, we have to look at the obesity epidemic, how it is developing. In some countries in Asia, in the, in the um, richer populations, the obesity is going down. But what we see is that in the poorer segments, it goes up. And this is exactly why I bring that, 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 that analysis in the way that we have to look at that. So your flavor, of course, absolutely. It's just one of those huge challenges because, yes, they taste very well. You see? I mean, I, 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 I personally, I read a lot from, uh, I said this already, from Corinna, Corinna Hawkes, H-A-W-K-E-S. Uh, she's now the food security specialist in the UK. If you look at some of, 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 of her uh, uh, publications, how intertwined the commodity market is and how you know, the, the commodity prices, they go and they fly and are volatile or not. And then you look at the other end in terms of the processed foods who are using, who are playing with some of those price fluctuations because then it can be exchanged with cheaper commodities. It's really a challenge to change something. So, thank you. <laughs> Any other burning questions? Yeah. Okay, very last question. Um, so, so, I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of people have this idea that artificial ingredients are bad. Um, so, artificial ingredients are bad. People have this idea, right? Uh, I was wondering if you could settle the, the point um, whether it's possible to have artificial foods or, or manufactured foods, designed foods, um, engineered foods that are wholly healthy and good for people without any detriment. Is that possible? Yeah, I showed you this. This is possible. I showed you, I showed you the slide where we used it for the uh, emergency, for the rehabilitation. This is, uh, this is a food based on uh, peanuts. Uh, and it has been, uh, you know, uh, developed in such a way that you can rehabilitate children. It's a highly processed food. There are other uh, highly processed foods, which is called, uh, they are all called uh, lipid uh, nutrient uh, spreads, LNS, uh, based on almonds, for example. So you can do that. And these foods, there's no like long-term risk or no. like a cancer risk or anything? No. Like Nothing? No, not that I know of. But you wouldn't eat them because you would be, this is uh, for rehabilitation, so you would need to be extremely malnourished uh, and then you would get those foods. It's a paste, you, you just open it. It was developed specifically for emergency setting where you have problems with transportation, where you have problems with reaching people, where you have problems with climate. So basically it's in a fuel, you open it, you eat it for six weeks and then you're rehabilitated and then you go onto a normal food again. So the notion of processed foods, everybody, it's not that I'm defending processed foods, I'm just, I just want to give you a neutral picture about what processed foods mean. I think, just to summarize, then I will stop it. Um, the, the notion of processed foods, often people say, oh, processed food is bad. No, that's not true. There are certain processed foods that are unhealthy and they are bad. There are certain processed foods that are not <coughs> unhealthy and are not bad, yeah? Because your rice is a processed food, your bread is a processed food. What we talk about is the ultra-processed foods, and even in the ultra-processed foods, you have foods that are good, and you have foods that are not good. Okay, let's end, and uh, once again, thank Regina for a very yeah, stimulating talk. You. We had a very engaged audience today, I feel. Thank you for coming.